Uh, I think I should be able to take control of the screen now, but I'm not seeing the drop down, unfortunately. Sorry, Tessa. <laughs> <clears throat> there we go. That should all be sorted for you. <clears throat> Okay, I think I'm uh, probably live. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on uh, where you are. I think we've got people logged on from all around the world, so a very warm welcome to, to all of you. Uh, my name is Jason Smith uh, at the University of, of Oxford in the Department of Materials, and uh, I am the, uh, the chair of this webinar uh, this morning for the new journal Materials of Quantum Technology, of which I'm the, uh, the editor-in-chief. So first of all, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Myla and Tessa from the Institute of Physics Publishing for, uh, for setting this up. I think it's going to be a, a very nice uh, webinar. And I think you can probably see on your, uh, well, uh, present here uh, in the forum as well are our, our three speakers uh, for uh, this morning. We've got uh, uh, Michael Flatte uh, from the uh, University of Iowa, currently based at University College London. We've got uh, Giordano. Uh, Scapucci from QTech, Delft University of Technology, and we've got Stefania Castelletto from Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology uh, in Australia. I don't think actually they can they can see you waving at the moment. They're probably looking at my uh, uh, my presentation screen. But uh, well, welcome to to the three to the three panelists. We're very much looking forward to your talks. Uh, so. Um, we have a slight change in the order of the presentations uh, compared to what is on the screen. We're going to start off with uh, Giordano Scapucci's uh, talk on the Germanium quantum information route uh, at about 10.40. Uh, and then we'll move on to Stefania Castelletto's talk on silicon carbide single photon sources, uh, challenges and prospects at about 11 o'clock. And then we'll finish off with uh, Michael Flatte's talk on quantum coherent coupling of spins to a single uh, a magnon mode. So each of the uh, talks is uh, about 20 minutes long, including a little bit of time uh, for uh, questions. And if you have questions that you'd like to ask uh, the speakers, please just post them to the Slido uh, website. So the URL for that is there at the bottom of the screen. I'll be keeping an eye on that, so I'll see the questions coming in, and then um, we'll be able to ask those at the end of the at the end of the individual talks. We will also have a 15 minute Q&A session at the end, about 11.40, just to mop up any other questions that we've got and maybe have a bit of a sort of general discussion uh, about, the, uh, about the subjects that we've heard about. So a uh, very exciting um, a group of talks, very much look, looking forward uh, to those. Um, and uh, I hope you will enjoy uh, the webinar uh, as well. I should say that these uh, talks are all uh, based on papers which have been published in, uh, in, in the journal uh, recently and some of our, our most uh, are read papers as well. So hopefully these will be really sort of interesting for you to uh, um, sort of hear directly from the, uh, from the authors of these papers. Before we start, I'd just like to say a little bit uh, introducing uh, the journal. So Materials for uh, Quantum Technology is a relatively a new journal. It started about uh, 18 months or so ago. And the idea of the journal is to really sort of um, develop an, an, a new area where we can um, uh, sort of have a community talking about the materials aspect of developing uh, quantum technologies. So it's a sort of multidisciplinary uh, journal. It includes materials science, uh, materials physics, bits of engineering, that kind of thing, and really thinking about what you need to do uh, with materials to make successful quantum technologies. So we're very excited uh, about the uh, sort of developing conversation that we're having uh, uh, in this space, and this is our sort of first uh, uh, venture in, into this uh, as a journal. Um, so the journal has all of the high editorial standards that you would expect from Institute of Physics Publishing uh, Journal. We're, we're after uh, papers which are likely to have a significant sort of impact uh, in the field, um, obviously a rigorous uh, peer review process uh, and a fast and efficient author service. So it's a really good place to uh, submit your new and exciting work. 
It's also an open access journal, so consistent uh, with most uh, uh, with most or all uh, funding agency requirements for publication. It's preprint friendly, as is uh, uh, the norm uh, these days, uh, and it's also a society-owned journal, so profits go to the Institute of, of Physics. Um, we are not charging any article processing charge, waiving the, uh, the APC until uh, the beginning of 2023. So you can submit uh, your uh, papers to this journal until the end of next year uh, without having to pay an article uh, processing charge, despite the fact that it's fully uh, open access. So hopefully that's an, an added incentive to get your papers in early. Um, you can see the URLs at the bottom of the screen here if you want uh, more information. If you haven't got those uh, already, uh, iopscience.org forward slash MQT for the journal itself, or you can email MQT at iopublishing.org uh, if you'd like more information. Okay, so as mentioned, our three uh, our talks today are uh, based on three uh, papers which have been published. Uh, uh, within the journal, uh, predicted strong coupling of solid state spins via a single uh, magnon mode, low percolation density and charge noise with holes in germanium, and silicon carbide single photon sources challenges and prospects. So the first two are in the sort of letter format, so those are new research, and the, the third one is a, a perspective uh, uh, written by um, Stefania here. So very much looking forward uh, uh, to your talks. And at this point, I think I will hand over to our first speaker, um, Giordana Scapucci. Okay, let's see. Uh, can somebody somehow give me a signal that you're looking at the right screen? It looks good. Yes. Looks good? Okay, perfect. Um, and you hear me well. All right, so um, thanks for inviting me to this webinar. Um, indeed, we published a paper in uh, MQT, and um, let me zoom out and tell you a little bit about uh, what we call the germanium quantum information route. So um, nature does really practical things with quantum mechanics, and uh, the idea that brings uh, many physicists, engineers, uh, uh, computer scientists, mathematicians together is that we would like to do uh, similarly with a quantum computer. For example, uh, this bird that you see on the, on the screen has really tiny uh, magnetic field uh, sensors to, to, to help uh, migration uh, routes. And uh, with these sensors, which are based on quantum mechanics, uh, these birds can sense the magnetic field of the Earth and every year follow uh, this uh, these migration paths. This is just an example. There are many others in nature. Um, but the idea here is really, it would be great if with a machine that uses quantum mechanics, we could do something useful uh, for us and eventually for the planet as well. Um, however, this is a very uh, daunting challenge because despite the hype you hear in the media, uh, useful quantum computation will require really a, a large number of qubits, millions. Um, and uh, not only they have to be a lot, but they have to be good. So you need millions of excellent qubits and putting together a system that can handle uh, these, uh, these components is very difficult, not only to, to, to build, it's actually different, difficult even to think about it. So to design a system like that uh, through all the stack and to actually operate it. And uh, Basic challenges include, uh, yeah, like the scaling up, but most importantly, uh, the keeping the quantum information alive. So fighting the coherence and uh, eventually maybe make them faster to be able to do quantum computation within the time uh, that we uh, that, that the information is alive. So this might be might sound a bit depressing because nowadays we have only, uh, let's say, in the in the order of tens of qubits. Uh, not 100. So, um, so yeah, the, the road ahead is, is pretty long and this is a serious challenge. However, um, this is, uh, there is hope. There is a lot of hope because if we look at the uh, trajectory of the microelectronic industry, for example, uh, this teaches us that we have actually built really phenomenally complex systems. So nowadays there are billions of uh, transistors that are packed in a, in a chip. So 
we can achieve these kind of numbers. And now if you look at uh, here, um, let me see if I'm, yeah, you should see my pointer. Um, at the trajectory in the last century, going from transistor in the 50s to the first integrated circuit in the 60s to then the microprocessor in the 70s, it took a long time from the first you know, proof of concept of a transistor down to something that was really useful, 20 years at least. And uh, along the way, for sure, you know, once the, the the power of these circuits was very limited, but then how did we get to the microprocessor and then without even talking about everything that happened after? Um, there is something very interesting here, which I think is very relevant for this webinar, is that if you really look carefully at the history of microelectronic industry, you can trace back all the breakthroughs that took us to these iconic achievements back to materials development. Transistor was built in germanium because really high pure crystals were available following research done on um, radio detectors in the, in the 40s. And um, then the, the step, the leap to uh, integrated circuit happened because we used the silicon instead of germanium, which could handle a process, a planar process to have a really uh, an oxide film and make uh, metal oxide semiconductor uh, structures. And by doing so with this planar process, we were able to pack together uh, more transistors in a circuit. This one is very interesting. Um, and actually, I, I suggest uh, to really uh, to, to read this book by the inventor of the microprocessor. Um, so this is the biography of, of Federico Fangin, one of the inventors of the microprocessor, where he explains how one of the key ingredients for, for making this happen was to switch from aluminium gates so metal gates to silicon gates so changing material was one of the key drivers to actually be able to scale up to a thousand transistors roughly packed in a processor uh, the other thing i want you to notice is uh, something very subtle but extremely important so here you have one component but you have three wires coming out so three connectors for one component you move on to the transit to the integrated circuit and you have uh, six connectors for a few transistors. And then here in the microprocessor, you have 16 uh, connectors for around a thousand transistors. So as you integrate more and more um, components in a system, you see how anyway the input output needs to still, uh, to still be manageable. So these are all challenges uh, that we think in the community could be addressed by making these uh, qubits uh, look like transistors. So wouldn't it be great if we can really leverage everything that has been done in the semiconductor industry for really attempt to integrate uh, many transistors, millions of them in a single uh, chip with just a few wires coming out. And the analogy can hold, and this is what we're working on. So this is a transistor, three terminals, source ring gate, and the gate acts as a simple tap for current to flow. Well, the same structure can be hacked to actually host the one single charge and use its spin as a qubit, so as a basic building block for quantum information. The nice thing is that we can do this in our labs, as I will show you uh, later, but this can also be done in a real industrial uh, semiconductor manufacturing facility. And uh, recently we have demonstrated uh, um, actually the, the making and, and the demonstration of the first spin qubits done in a real uh, semiconductor foundry. Um, so this, this would be the dream to really, you know, be able to leverage uh, all of this uh, know-how. However, of course, uh, the question is still, uh, uh, still there, how to do this and what is the best material? And, uh, but my belief really is that as, you know, uh, as I showed you just a few minutes ago, the drivers for these important leaps in microelectronic industry were traced back to materials. I think the same will happen for quantum computing. As we're engineering these very large quantum systems with transistor qubits, I think the material advances will empower quantum computing. So this is what my group is doing. We're working with two platforms, silicon and germanium, strained into a silicon germanium uh, crystal all integrated into onto a silicon wafer to ensure uh, compatibility with the industry. And of course, this is a, a, a teamwork. Uh, this is my group, but we are working uh, with many other groups. And mainly for what I wanna talk here today 
about germanium. Uh, it's a, a tight collaboration between my group that develops the materials and the group of Man of Elfdors, and his group develops uh, the qubits. So here we're talk about we're gonna talk about germanium because we started exploring germanium as a material for spin qubits only a few years ago, but the progress has been extremely uh, fast uh, for a number of reasons. Also because there is a tight collaboration uh, into a really an ecosystem to drive the innovation. So what we are working on is not uh, bulk germanium, but actually strain germanium quantum wells. So germanium and silicon have different lattice parameters, uh, but you know there's a nice alloy which is silicon germanium, which can take a, a, a lattice parameter in between the two. So by working with silicon germanium heterostructures, you can tune the band structure uh, of these uh, materials, for example, to accommodate here to confine holes into this quantum well. So this is a structure we will look at. And uh, uh, keep in mind that a quantum well for holes exists only for uh, germanium-based uh, structures here and not for silicon, where they, it's possible to confine electrons but not holes. So uh, germanium will compressively strain to be lattice matched and it will host a two-dimensional hole gas at the start. But why are we interested uh, in strain germanium for quantum dot qubits? Uh, well, there are a few, there are a few reasons. Uh, the main is that there is really a band structure advantage because once you work with these strain germanium quantum wells, uh, you got a single valence band. So the energy spacings are, are very large, uh, which is very important to keep quantum information where you store it. Uh, holes in strain germanium have an extremely light effective mass. And this means that you can achieve quantum confinement with larger structures because the energy level spacings are, are larger. And there is spin-orbit coupling, which allows you to uh, drive qubits locally uh, via electric fields that then translate to magnetic fields. Germanium is a great material to achieve a high um, environment, a high quality quantum grade, we call it environment, where there is low disorder and little interaction with nuclear uh, nuclear spins. And furthermore, germanium can be, can be purified into a nuclear spin-free material. And this interaction with the nuclear spins are the, the, the main cause for decoherence. Finally, germanium can be integrated into a CMOS foundry. And uh, these devices have a very small footprint because uh, you only need the, the elements you have in a transistor to, to make a qubit. Um, very nicely, uh, you can use directly metallic contacts uh, to the whole channel. And this opens up uh, very important avenues into hybrid semiconducting, superconducting devices, which I will not talk about today, but this is a, another uh, very interesting route that we are pursuing. So um, why now and not before? Uh, so as I said, that really this field of using germanium for qubits took off in the, in the past few years after our, our, our work with uh, quantum wells, but in reality, I mean, these germanium quantum wells have a long history that traces back to the 90s. And from a material perspective, the, the breakthrough was around the 2010, when uh, the mobility of these structures uh, suddenly achieved around a million, which put them really on par, I mean, with, uh, with high quality 3.5 materials. And how did that happen? Well, the challenge here with this structure was to get a germanium rich, uh, a silicon germanium layer to be a template for the for the growth of the quantum well. The trick here was to reverse, basically to grow germanium directly on silicon and then grade the silicon into the structure to then achieve a really nice silicon germanium layer. Here you see some electron microscope images on how these structures look like. So they are really like you design them. And if you do X-ray characterization, you can measure the strain levels and they're basically as you want them. And here, what you have to keep in mind are these three critical parameters, which are the quantum well thickness, the separation from the oxide interface, and the composition of a, a, a germanium concentration in the alloy. So by playing with these three knobs, we can really tune a lot about this structure. And uh, we've done so, and we achieved a really high uh, material for hosting qubits. It has a, a mobility of around half a million. You can measure all, uh, you know, kind of uh, 2D physics, uh, uh, these are beautiful quantum wall effects like textbook. And here we can now really uh, prove that we have a single valence band material from these measurements. 
We can also measure the effective mass of the system without going into details. Um, the high quality allows to measure the mass in transport. And you can see in this plot how the mass at, at small densities, meaning near the K equals zero part of the band structure is really very light, 0.05 um, uh, mass, electron mass. And this is really the lightest mass ever measured for a material that hosts a spin qubit. And again, the nice thing is that you can do all the theory and just the experiments match with the theory, which is very neat because it means that you can really design your structures and now make them in the lab and then implement feedback loops to then go back and tune your parameters. So with this material now in place in 2018, so after a couple of years of working on this, we were able to make uh, uh, really in a very short time, in only two years, went from materials to spin qubits. It took uh, silicon uh, many more years and Gallium Marcin even more to, to get to this point. And of course, all the know-how we, we had helped, but uh, also these intrinsic properties of the material are uh, the origin of this really uh, fast progress. Here you see a structure where with a nanoscale gates from the top, you can confine charge. And it's basically like a transistor with source drain and a gate where you can isolate these single charges and with these other gates around, manipulate the coupling between the charge and really measure signatures of forming quantum dots, where here you can basically, upon changing this gate in between, you can tune transport from being like a single large quantum dot to being two isolated uh, quantum dots. And then you can, uh, you, can you, can, you can use them as qubits. And here you see, uh, two qubit logic, so the state of one qubit depends on the state of the other, and you see these Rabi oscillations, which are a signature of coherent quantum control of the system. Uh, these are very fast, if you look at the time scale, meaning that this uh, qubit works extremely fast because it's driven by spin orbit uh, coupling. And so this is a, it's a good uh, asset for uh, making a lot of quantum operation within, a, let's say, a coherent style. Uh, here, the last thing I want to talk about is once we have qubits, and here again, it's the importance of materials, is then to go back and really tailor your material to advance the, the properties of the qubit. So we've done this, and then we actually published this to result in materials for quantum technology by starting playing with the depth at which we position the quantum well. And here there is a trade-off between uh, separation from the dielectric interface. So you want it to have it deep to be away from the nasty interface, but at the same time, you don't want it too deep uh, that you are losing the control that you, you need with your gates. So we find this uh, sweet spot at around the 50 to 60 nanometers, where we have a very good, uh, uh, still a very good mobility, around 200, 300,000. But most importantly, we have a very low charge noise measured in quantum dots, because we are moving away from the interface. And with these improvements in place, we were able to move to a four qubit quantum processor, which we published uh, uh, this year. Again, you see the very fast progress enabled also by the material development. And this uh, sets the state of the art with all kinds of semiconductor spin qubits. And you see here the four qubits, the Rabi oscillations. Again, you can see the quality compared to the previous ones of all four qubits individually uh, here. Or what we can do is we can perform a, a single qubit gates, so rotating one qubit, or we can make two qubit talk to each other, or three or four, so one, two, three, and four qubit gates. So here you see the resonance frequency related to a qubit split in eight, because there are eight possible combinations of the other three qubits. And then we can also run a very simple quantum algorithm, where here we are entangling the four states, and then disentangling them back to their original state, all in a coherent way within the time frame uh, given by the coherent star. Here are a few, a bit of a few numbers of the metrics, and you can find more in the paper. Uh, finally, I, I mentioned the, there is also the the nice thing that we can contact this transistor with uh, metal and meaning superconductor, so we can push a supercurrent in the channel. This can be very interesting for making semi-super devices, which are, can complement the spin qubit for building an architecture for scalability. So the road ahead is uh, 
very long. Uh, we have a lot of challenges, but uh, I hope I, I convinced you that I gave you one example where changing material, moving to germanium opened up a lot of opportunities. And similarly, I think other uh, discoveries will take us on this path towards a practical quantum computer. And with this, I want to thank you for your attention. Bobby, thank you very much, Giordano. Very interesting talk. Okay, uh, glancing at the uh, Slido now, um, there is a question which has come in. Um, how important, I'm sorry, I don't have any names attributed to these questions. They will just come through as anonymous. So um, uh, the question is, how important is mass for spin qubit materials? You say, you say this is the lightest. What is the significance for application in quantum technologies? Yes, this is a very important question. So if you think of the simple, let me simplify the, the problem. Uh, the simple particle in a box problem in, in quantum mechanics, the one that you solve uh, university around the so the le energy level spacing goes with one over uh, d times n. And so if you have a, a light mass, you will have large energy spacing. That means that for a given structure of a, of a dimension, let's say a quantum dot with a diameter of uh, d equals, I don't know, uh, 100 nanometers, in silicon, for example, has a mass of 0 0.2, the energy spacing will be very small. But in germanium, which is 0 0.05, it will be very large. And that's the, re the reason why qubits in germanium are basically have dimensions that are larger than qubits in silicon, but still very small that you can integrate many of them together. So it's really a nice property here, having a light mass, because it means that you can have slightly larger structures that are able to average out maybe disorder and make more reproducible devices and easier to make. So it is a very important asset to have. And yep. therefore, the, the germanium uh, quantum dots were very uh, simple to make once you had a good uh, material to start with. Thank you. I guess an equivalent benefit is that you can go to slightly higher temperatures as well, right? But the preference yeah, is to go to larger the, structures instead. Yeah, yeah it sets uh, the, the temperature scale as well. Then you have to see all, also all the other energy skills you have in place, but definitely it gives a, a, at least one upper boundary that is higher. Um, one other question was just where can we find the slides for the presentation? I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure we're providing slides, but that's something that we, that we can talk about later in, in the Q&A. Um, I, I did have one question actually. In, in, in your paper, you mentioned that the um, a limiting factor of the uh, mobility is impurities at the, um, at the semiconductor dielectric interface. I was just wondering if you could say a bit more about that. Do we know what, what impurities those are? Yeah, so it's basically the... Um... The main source of disorder is uh, the impurities at the, um, at the semiconductor um, dielectric interface, same as in a transistor. And it, it's simply we are using a low temperature oxide uh, around 300 degrees because we don't want to ruin the strain in the quantum well. So the quantum well is grown at around 500 degrees, so you cannot put a dielectric uh, at a higher temperature. And therefore, you have traps there that uh, will Basically, what do what they do is that if you think of your quantum well as a again a particle in a box. What they will do is they will introduce a bit of fluctuations in the bottom of the quantum well, and therefore imagine if you have wild fluctuations when you define a quantum dot, then it's basically it's not uh, how you define it, but where the quantum dot sits in the quantum well depends on on the disorder. Yeah. That's what you do not want. So, so basically, um, reducing this, these charges at the interface is really important. You can do that either by playing with the other structure, as we did, so putting a, um, the quantum well a bit deeper, but really engineering also the oxide interface, and, and that's also what we're working on. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um... But again, just a comment on this. Uh, you see here the analogy with the transistor world that I was mentioning at the beginning. These challenges might have been already solved, so we are tapping into some know-how to, to, to solve them again for our application. That's the yeah. beauty of it. Yeah. Thanks. Giordano, <clears throat> one more question has come in, but I think 
we'll save it for the uh, Q&A session uh, at the end. Thanks again. Okay, um, uh, Stefania, if you're ready, we can move on to your uh, presentation now. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, um, hopefully, uh, can you see my screen? Uh, yes. No, maybe. <laughs> Uh, is that uh, I don't know if you see you see my pre my screen like the, the PowerPoint. Yeah, that's all good. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you uh, very much for inviting me and um, in this webinar. And um, yeah, I will um, talk about uh, yes the content of the paper that I um, brought for the, the special issue on materials for quantum technology, um, which is uh, in fact related to another material, which is um, silicon carbide. In particular, I will focus on an aspect, uh, quantum aspect of this material, which is um, um, single photon sources. Um, okay, so this is uh, the outline of my presentation. So I will briefly give you uh, a little uh, timeline of what single photon source uh, are today, and in particular what um, is uh, the relevance of the material in this space, because uh, as we see that there have been a lot of type of single photon source and, uh, and what's the role of in particular silicon carbide and what kind of application that um, uh, this material will be better uh, to address uh, and then uh, uh, I will focus on a bit more on the quantum aspects of, uh, uh, of silicon carbide in terms of, uh, of a single photon source in particular color center responsible for for that uh, quantum emission um, and then I would briefly mention about uh, the material properties of photonics and, and a linear device uh, which uh, give us a, a full picture of uh, uh, where this material stands uh, in in the space of uh, quantum uh, technology today. Okay, so uh, as uh, you know, uh, the single photon source is uh, known since many years. So the first uh, single photon source uh, were observed in the 70s, uh, and then in the 80s, uh, single ion trap and parametric down conversion were used for for um, um, uh, investigating quantum optics properties uh, in the 90s, single molecules, and it's not until uh, the 2000 that um, the um, uh, the quantum dots uh, uh, in gas, uh, quantum dots, and the MV center in diamond. Uh, were were studied, um, and uh, after that, uh, uh, single photon source becomes a more uh, a technology, I would say, than uh, something uh, like more for application. And particularly, so this, this challenge will to make it simple, like uh, so colloidal quantum dots were uh, were studied uh, because they were representing room temperature single photon source, and on the other end. The search was going towards uh, infrared emission, and uh, in in the years uh, where silicon carbide appeared as a quantum material, we are uh, in 2013. Um, other material also uh, uh, appeared as possible quantum uh, uh, quantum materials, uh, as you can see, like zinc oxide. Uh, more nitrate, so they require a lot. So as you can see, the, the story is not finished. <laughs> uh, we're moving uh, forward to uh, all possible type of material, including graphene uh, and uh, perovskite quantum dots, and and uh, recently even silicon on insulator. So that means that uh, this is uh, still a uh, quite um, um, open area of research uh, because uh, the ideal single photon source is uh, possible not uh, available yet. Um, I'm just sorry. No. Um. I had a little bit, uh, okay. Uh, so in this slide, so we can see that um, um, 
uh, how silicon, you know, why silicon carbide is uh, considered quantum material. So essentially, it is uh, the opposite to the, what we just see in Germany, is a wide band gap semiconductor. So it belongs to this category uh, together with diamond, and um, that means that uh, uh, within the band gap there there are uh, color centers. So our uh, defects and um, in addition to that um, the, there are properties of silicon carbide they are similar for to other um, photonics material like lithium niobate so in other words it has a, a good uh, chi2 uh, second order nonlinearity uh, which uh, permits uh, also nonlinear uh, photonics uh, in, in, so uh, therefore the combination of this uh, Part. So the possibility to have a, a color center and also uh, optical properties that can lead to nonlinear photonics uh, is, a, is a quite interesting if we compare to uh, other platform which may have one or not the other. Um, okay, so therefore the single photo source in silicon carbide are basically vacancy in, in, uh, in the lattice and so uh, within the bang up um, uh, system uh, with the um, uh, ground state, excited state, and the stable state uh, is uh, generated. And so, upon a, a optical excitation, you can have a stream of photos that can be detected in the B splitter. So, we can see the uh, anti bunching, typical anti bunching curve. Uh, so, in addition to have an optical transition, there is typically in most of the defects in silicon carbide a spin transition. Okay, that makes uh, even more interesting. Um, let's say that, however, because there are so many single photo sources, uh, one should really uh, find a way to uh, classify them. And so there are now a lot of papers discussing what are the criteria for the ideal single photo source. And here they are again listed. Uh, so we certainly look at the photo stability, purity, brightness. Uh, uh, indistinguishability of single photon, um, uh, emission spectral region, eye repetition rate, and, and other uh, like uh, um, room temperature operation, eye extraction efficiency. And also one of those is a speed photon interface. This is typical for um, color center in uh, one, band, uh, one band semiconductor like diamond. And so the application um, we know that single fossils are kept applied mostly into a quantum information process or metrology. And uh, let's say that for silicon carbide, we can see uh, application in quantum sensing uh, super resolution uh, imaging and also uh, spin photon quantum networks. Um, and important to see that um, uh, the application is directly linked to the properties of the single photon source. And as example, optical quantum computation, uh, it's very demanding to terms of uh, characteristics. So uh, the, the spin photo quantum networks, it's uh, uh, definitely the space where this single photo source could have the best opportunity. <clears throat> Sorry, why is not moving? Sorry. Was Sorry, I had uh, I don't know why this slide is not okay. So um, okay, so uh, in fact, you can see here uh, they are just listed the the, the requirement in terms of purity, in, in, in extraction efficient, in distinguishability. So the optical quantum community is, is as we know is extremely uh, demanding, while it is much less demanding for some quantum imaging or even spin photon entanglement, that's less demanding um, uh, application. So uh, for what concerns speed photon quantum network, uh, many of you might know what this means. So basically we can if, uh, foresee the opportunity for uh, color center silicon carbide like in diamond that um, when they couple uh, the electron spin is coupled with nuclear spin uh, and we have indistinguishable photon, we can uh, um, have a, a, a tagment generation and distribution in quantum network, for instance, uh, using waveguides and uh, uh, photonic cavity. Um, um, and also, uh, we need to remind that also the single photo source design has changed over, over time. So from the first commercial 
type of single photo source, which was simply a nano diamond uh, attached to a fiber uh, to micro cavity, uh, open micro cavity and the micro pillars with quantum dots. Uh, we are tending now to think that the future should be integration of single photo source in uh, planar photonics, even though the best single photo source are still today uh, uh, micro pillars uh, uh, group for uh, three and five uh, quantum dots. And for what concerns silicon carbide, the, the properties of this material are they are very favorable uh, is the, the fact that um, it's a de device friendly material, so uh, we, we can uh, we can have a commercial vapor of um, intrinsic and doped material, and uh, and also there is opportunity epitaxy that uh, it's uh, it's good for what concern um, the photonics and also the possibility to have nonlinear optical properties for um, frequency generation conversion. Um, so in this uh, slide you can see uh, various uh, 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 color centers, silicon carbide, they have been identified as a single uh, photon emitter and, and also a spin photon interface, uh, some of them. Um, so the visible ones are, are not spin photon interface but are very bright uh, emitters. Um, and then we have emission uh, of recently silicon vacancy, uh, which is uh, in uh, the region of uh, 900 nanometer. Um, and um, uh, light vacancy, which is a double vacancy, which is around 1,000 nanometer, but and, and this the V center in silicon carbide in uh, 1,200 nanometer, and uh, the vanadium um, impurity in silicon carbide is um, uh, around 1,300 nanometer. Uh, so all these have been verified single photometer and. and and uh, some of them, uh, I would say most of them, have also optical spin readout and, uh, and um, so they can be used in a spin photo interface. Okay, so for example, the silicon, the silicon vacancy, um, it's, uh, um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, very, it's a very complex defect because there's a spin three and a half, but um, in these defects, um, it's very photostable uh, and um, it has been integrated in photonic cavities and, um, and the, the single photon has been found to be uh, Fourier transform limited. So, um, um, and in addition to that, uh, uh, it's possible using these defects to uh, um, create uh, uh, multi photo cluster states. So, and uh, it's, that, it's already been demonstrated um, just recently, um, uh, quantum gates uh, in, into uh, photonics uh, uh, way guides, uh, uh, triangular like uh, triangular way guide in silicon carbides uh, due to dipolar coupling with the uh, vaccine silicon. So this is quite a promising color center. The brightest uh, single photos of room temperature are in the visible and are attributed to carbon anti vacancy um, pair um, and um, other emitters that are uh, potentially not, not yet fully understood but uh, are the interface with the silicon oxide and, and can be controlled and ex excite also electrically and, and they are quite bright. Um, and, um, and then the recently uh, the work has been done also in the NV center in silicon carbide and vanadium uh, which have um, um, uh, but the in this case the, uh, the study from for this from spin point of view is is limited anyway they are still um, uh, operating I mean the NV center operating room temperature and um, is uh, the greenest time is quite long the uh, speed. From the point of view of the photonics, this is a quite challenging uh, space because it's true that it's a, it's a good material, but there are uh, many challenge, challenges still. Um, as you can see, the evolution in the last year, the, the, the cavity silicon carbide have reached a very uh, high cube, which is uh, on pair of what is done uh, in diamond, uh, but it's not yet at the um, quality of uh, silicon or even um, um, yes, uh, let's say silicon. Um, uh, so therefore, there's still uh, quite a bit of work to do to improve uh, the photonics, uh, even though there is quite a lot of improvement, particularly in relation to uh, silicon carbide on insulator, uh, which has uh, uh, recently, which has been optimized. And so 
and it probably is based to uh, reduce the losses uh, in this material, optical losses. And from the point of view of nonlinear photonics, they are quite good because uh, um, there are already several devices uh, that could permit uh, frequency conversion of sing single photon source. Um, so if we look at the as a summary, the, the single photon source in silicon carbide are the room temperature are quite bright and um, um, there is already um, uh, it has been achieved a good level of um, of purity and uh, of indistinguishability. I thought this is at four, at four Kelvin, and uh, and definitely the integration in photonics is on par with um, with the diamond. Uh, and um, let's say that they're they're not as as pure as uh, the the single photon source in quantum dots. Um, and, but there are some advantage, uh, uh, which is uh, definitely the greenest time, which has reached uh, five seconds at five Kelvin. And uh, so uh, let's say that uh, perhaps uh, each color center may have uh, a specific application uh, and challenges. So, for instance, the visible emitter uh, are bright; uh, it can have uh, can be controlled electrical by, by surface passivation, and it's possible to achieve frequency conversion, and, um, and, and potentially it's possible to achieve electrical detective spin and these uh, defects. However, uh, the, the challenges of uh, uh, achieving um, uh, indistinguishing photo could be uh, uh, quite uh, big. Um, and for what concern uh, the silicon vacancy uh, in silicon carbide, this seems to have the best uh, outlook in terms uh, of property of single photon source for uh, speed photo interface, uh, whether the, the challenges could be that this is still a low brightness uh, um, emitter. Um, and, um, and then uh, the double vacancy is a similar uh, characteristic of the single, uh, the mono vacancy, except that the, there's better outlook here in terms of, uh, of the MR optical detect magnetic resonance, so for magnetic sensing, uh, this could have a, um, um, a better uh, opportunity and, um, and also Single shot readout has been demonstrated in this uh, in this color center. Uh, one of the problems is still the low brightness uh, in uh, uh, the vacancy, and so the um, NV in uh, silicon carbide is still uh, under investigation. And so uh, the potential prospect in is a good uh, uh, single photo source SP4 inter interface system. Um, and for what concern uh, the photonics, uh, uh, as I said before, there is a, quite a still uh, a bit of challenges in what for what concern improving the the, the silicon carbide on insulator uh, to reduce further the losses and to the a coupling between the uh, single photo source and the photonics. However, um, if this could be achieved, definitely the, the platform could uh, definitely go uh, better than what it is uh, at the moment. And all right, thank you very much for the attention. Sorry if I went potentially a bit too late because. Um, That's perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Stefania, for a very interesting talk. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions in the um, in, in the chat there. Oh no, here's one now. Um, do you see the challenges overcome in the next few years? It's quite a broad question. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because there are several challenges. They're slightly different depending on what you're looking for. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I think the the this challenge that are associated to these meters are very similar to other meters in other materials. So um, very common. So um, yeah, and I I think that there are options for because uh, the functionality are available are more and so perhaps uh, um, both in the electrical control um, and um, and uh, um, and also the integration in photonics I see that more more viable than but yeah not it's not trivial as we thought at the beginning but one of the aspects of silicon carbide is that it doesn't have a center of symmetry right uh, yes, like yes. diamond and we know that that's important for, for defects in the context of 
the nitrogen vacancy centre in Diamond versus the Group 4 vacancies. Do you think that might be a limiting factor at all? Um, it doesn't uh, seem to have been for the vacancy silicon, uh, which in fact, um, yeah, so the purity is quite good, uh, even, you know, better than NV. Uh, has been demonstrated as such, so that seems to have been um, solved. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thanks again, Stefania. Um, so let's now move on to our, our final talk of the of the morning. Uh, Michael, if you're ready to present, I'll hand over to you. I think you're still muted, Michael. I tried to unmute, but here I am. Um, all right, is the slide visible correctly? Yes, it is. Sorry, I muted myself. <laughs> <laughs> no All right, well, uh, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to tell you a bit about some of this recent work on strong coupling of solid state spins to a single magnon mode that appeared in uh, Materials for Quantum Technology, first issue. Um, I have to say I really enjoyed the interaction with the journal. Uh, we had a bit of a race to try to get this out and they were quite helpful in um, allowing us to uh, publish after all of the appropriate review but on a, in a timely fashion. So I'm going to be talking about an element of quantum transduction involving uh, transfer of quantum information from a localized spin system to a magnon mode occupancy. And so on the screen, I'm showing a few things here. Um, on the uh, lower right, this is a picture from the Materials for Quantum Technology uh, paper. Uh, and we have taken a little farther as well to explore entangling gates between NVs. This is work that's uh, FISREV X Quantum in press, and that's uh, this in the upper right. Uh, lower left is an image of how we tend to think about spin coherence in these systems, the importance of the quenching of charge degrees of freedom that allows the spin coherence to be exceptionally long. And then in the upper left is an uh, image from one of our projects involving entangling photons with, uh, with individual spins. So this work is supported by the Department of Energy and in collaboration with Dennis Candido, Zeke Johnston Halpern, and Greg Fuchs, and then the later work in PRXQ with uh, Masaya Fukami and David Ashlo. So uh, why is the Department of Energy interested in this? this is uh, something I'll just show briefly. They have an interest in next generation quantum systems. And from their point of view, the area of interest uh, that we're focusing on is this uh, category three here, which is discover novel approaches to quantum to quantum transduction. So this is an example of a form of quantum transduction where the quantum information moves from one form, one physical form into another form. And this is a general, um, well, this is one major example of a general phenomena that we like to think of as hybrid quantum systems. Uh, hybrid quantum systems really have drawn a lot of recent attention because people have realized there is no single system that will have ideal properties for coupling, spin coherence, etc. You really need to use hybrid systems to get the best of multiple material systems. And that pertains to things like qubit design. So if you think about the transmon qubit, this is already a hybrid quantum system involving a, uh, a coupled microwave photon and the excitation of the superconducting device. So in a sense, it's predominantly microwave photon, but then the superconducting device gives it the nonlinearity that is essential to make it into a real qubit with well-defined zero and one. Another major category for hybrid is transduction, which I'll talk about in the context of this MQT article. And then a third is qubit entanglement, which is the more recent work. So our interest in transduction from localized spin information to magnon occupancy, you know, sort of motivated by this entangling gate that was proposed by David Loss's group about eight years ago. 
and this was a pretty uh, um, you know general proposal and it was uh, certainly a, uh, perhaps more qualitative than quantitative because it involved uh, disks of magnetic material with uh, somewhat abstract properties that were coupled by a one-dimensional spin chain. And so from, from our point of view, we wanted to see, is there a way to couple between spins in magnon modes? Is there a way to couple spins to spins uh, using materials in which we can put in the full details of the materials themselves and do an assessment of whether this is something that can actually happen? And so our first endeavor in this was this uh, modification of this proposal and evaluation of whether it would work based on a disk of magnetic material with a different magnetic geometry shown down below here. So we have a disk of magnetic material with the magnetization out of plane, and that allows us to look at internal spin wave modes of the disk. So in the initial proposal, these were all uniform modes. Here we're looking at modes that have internal structure. And the reason for that is to take advantage of the lower mode volume for the spin waves in these systems. So in a disk with magnetization out of plane, like below, uh, there are these modes that exist along the edge of the disk called daemon eschbach modes that are going to be more localized there and therefore have higher mode volume. And when you wanna do coupling between, um, say, a, a localized spin and a single magnon, um, uh, mode changing its occupancy by one, that modal volume is going to be absolutely critical. So uh, here's a, an image from the, the paper itself showing in 3D the geometry where we imagine there would be one or more NVs below and this disk up above. And uh, the spin waves of this disk we had to calculate because for this type of geometry they had not been explored um, in detail. So we have analytic and numerical calculations of that. This is the uh, animation of their motion as they move around the edge of the disk, thereby carrying in principle um, you know, excitations around from one spin to the other. Now we also have to have those modes be in resonance with the transitions of the spin center. So shown on the bottom left are the uh, the energy states um, and effectively the transition energies for the NV center. So the zero is down at the bottom and then the plus and minus one at zero applied field will be degenerate. So you start to apply a DC field along the axis of the NV, you're gonna start to split those away and you can bring that NV uh, transition into resonance with these magnet modes. And those are relatively sharp, as indicated here, so you really need a low-loss material. And that's what drew us to the organic ferry magnet, vanadium tetrocyanoethylene. So this is perhaps a bit of an exotic uh, material for many, but it has exceptionally low damping. The damping, in fact, the magnetic damping is lower than that of yttrium iron garnet, which is typically the gold standard. And since it's an organic material, it can be uh, fabricated with evaporative deposition and can be patterned considerably simply, sim much simpler than yttrium iron garnet itself. All right, so let's look at the metrics that are relevant for coupling um, spins to magnons. So uh, we are interested in this cooperativity and cooperativity is essentially the number of oscillations that you can get between quantum information in the localized spin and quantum information in the magnon mode occupancy. So this cooperativity is one, then you should be able to do one transduction from localized spin to magnon mode occupancy, but you want to have higher than one because that will give you an indication of the fidelity of that kind of transduction. So the pieces that go into this are an NV magnon coupling, which we calculate for this geometry for reasonable parameters to be about 10 kilohertz. You also need a magnon decay rate. Here's where the low loss is essential. And so for this material, it's about 100 kilohertz. And then you need an NV coherence time, which in some of the best material 
is in excess of a millisecond. So, you know, these parameters also depend on, particularly that NV magnon coupling strength, depend on the size of the disk. And the relevant size of the disk really is of order of micron. Because the idea that we're working with is that it's very difficult to address multiple spins between um, together. If you look at the characteristic link scale for the exchange between two spins, it's of order nanometers. So exchange or dipolar interaction, again, maybe you know a few more nanometers, but still very low, um, very small distances. And so we really want to make these solid state qubits bigger. That's a bit counterintuitive, but how do you make them bigger? And in part, the way you can make them bigger is by having uh, moving qubit, uh, qubits that can connect one to the other. And the reason for focusing on magnons rather than photons is in a sense, you know, photonic systems are too big. So you want something that's at that kind of micron scale that will efficiently connect one to the other, hence focusing on uh, coherent magnons. All right, so um, let's look at the calculation, well, let's look at the results that we get for the cooperativity of this particular system. So shown here is an image of this one micron diameter disk that's 100 nanometers tall. And that's sitting on top of a slab of diamond. We are assuming it's 111 oriented diamond because that's the way the magnetic field needs to be applied for the spin to magnon transduction to work. And then what's plotted here are the cooperativities as a function of position. And so you can see that they are really the largest when they are at the edge of the disk uh, as we expect based on these whispering gallery kinds of spin wave modes. This here is uh, at a distance about 30 nanometers below the surface of diamond. So it's a slice uh, below the disk. And on the right is a slice uh, through the disk and the material underneath. The green region is in fact the disk itself. Uh, and you can see the cooperativity can get quite high in excess of 30 uh, for regions that are reasonable. Now we're focusing on this white box down here. And the reason for that is that the spin coherence times of NVs get shorter when they get close to the surface. So if we want to avoid that problem, we'll consider NVs that are 30 nanometers or more below the surface of diamond. And there's a uh, range of um, accuracy for implantation of nitrogen if you want to make implanted NV centers. And so with a very conservative estimate of that, 100 nanometers wide, 60 nanometers tall, this gives us a, a large region where the cooperativity is much in excess of 10. And so we can expect cooperativities on the order of 15 or 20 uh, in such a system, which means we should get pretty good fidelity for NV to magnon mode occupancy uh, transduction. All right, um, a little comment about the, uh, you know, the, how YIG comes into play in this geometry. You might say, well, why don't you focus on YIG even if it's harder because the saturation magnetization is 30 times bigger than this organic ferry magnet, so your cooperativity should be higher. Well, it turns out that uh, part of the issue with that is that the uh, energies of these magnon modes are quite different. The frequency versus magnetic field is quite different. And so uh, if you compare these curves of intersection of the NV transitions with those for VTC and E down below, you can see that the chirality of this transition has changed. And it's very difficult to get a resonance with a magnon mode that's uh, that's reasonable that has an azimuthal quantum number six or seven rather than very very high and even then the chirality has switched so that's a challenge for this situation okay so now in just last couple of minutes i'm going to talk briefly about the uh, extension of this to nv nv entanglement so this is looking at uh, the magnons now as a mediating uh, form between two NVs, and we're gonna to try to make entangling gates between them. 
And for this, we're returning to YIG uh, from our VTC and E case. And the reason for that is that we're going to look at a different geometry with the magnetic field in plane. And so if we're just trying to do entanglement, it turns out that this geometry has some advantages. Uh, in particular, we can do non-resonant entanglement and take advantage of a minimum in the dispersion of magnons, which will give you a large density of states coupling the, uh, the two NVs together. So we've then calculated this coupling and um, we find that the entanglement rate for these NVs for you know, a somewhat aggressive geometry here, um, the main aggressive aspect is this uh, five nanometers uh, below the diamond surface of the NV. Uh, this kind of bar of YIG is perfectly reasonable, 20 nanometers by 120 by three microns. We find entanglement rates on the order of a megahertz and gate to decoherence ratios uh, of order 750. So this means it should be a very efficient way to get good NVNV entanglement. Now, our calculations for this, I'm gonna just uh, allude to how we do this. Because I'm a theorist, I should at least tell you how this is done. Uh, these are density matrix dynamic calculations using Lindblad equations. And uh, we assess, for example, the CHSH violation, which is a measure of how much uh, you have of the Bell's inequality. And we calculate that as a function of time for interaction of these systems. And I encourage you to look at the paper if you'd like to see more details on this, because I'm going to be out of time. Uh, furthermore, uh, we've compared the situation of resonant versus non-resonant as a function of temperature to find that if you're looking at um, the entanglement, you'll get faster generation of entanglement through resonant coupling, which makes sense, but it's going to be less robust as you raise the temperature, you start to occupy the magnon modes, which gives you a variation in the coupling via the magnon modes, which shows up as noise. So uh, at you know, higher temperatures, meaning above 150 millikelvin, you're really going to want to do non-resonant coupling to get the NV, entangle NV, NV entanglement. All right, so I'm just going to conclude by uh, summarizing with uh, kind of some views of hybrid quantum systems with magnons, you know, this ideal geometry and performance and the materials you choose really depends on the nature of the coupling and the magnonic system that you're going to work with. So when we were looking at VTC and E, this organic ferry magnet, it really was a disk with out of plane magnetic field, which gave us some new functionality. If you look at YIG, then you're going to really be focused much more on these kind of long bar. Uh, configurations. And I'd argue there are many open opportunities for dramatic improvements in performance, such as looking at rare earth spin centers in high frequency magnetic materials like barium hexaferrite. Uh, there's really important work being done to try to understand the, uh, the loss in magnetic materials at very low temperatures, at Dilfridge temperatures. These seem to be coming from paramagnetic impurities. And I think there also are some interesting optomagnonic uh, approaches to try to, uh, to cool the magnon modes in a non-equilibrium fashion. So I'll just put up some acknowledgments here. Um, the work I was talking about today in my current group was done with Dennis Candido, uh, some of the people from the, in the rest of the group, external collaborations with Chicago, Cornell, and Ohio State. And again, thanks to the Department of Energy. Uh, we're also looking for PhD and postdocs at the moment, uh, so please send me an email if you have an interest in that. So again, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Michael. Okay, so we'll do a couple of uh, questions that have been directed um, uh, to Michael uh, in the chat, and then we'll um, bring everyone else in and uh, and move on to the to the general uh, discussion. Uh, so there's one here which is how does the spin texture of the disk uh, look at zero field? Oh, so the spin texture of the disk, I mean, this is a magnetic material. And um, so it has 
um, you know, because of the way the geometry works, there is a, there is a shape anisotropy that's going to give you something that that looks somewhat pinned more at the more at the edge. But you know, in fact, the uh, in the absence of magnetic field and in the absence of excitation, it should pretty much be a uniform magnetization. So there's no spin texture. These are uh, spin textures arising due to excitation. Okay. And another question about what is the length scale of the edge modes? Right, so those uh, edge modes are, um, you know, extended around the entire circumference of the disk because they're normal modes of the disk. Um, in terms of the length scale radially, uh, that depends on the azimuthal index. So if you start with the, uh, you know, low azimuthal index, they'll pretty much be extended throughout the disk, but as you go to higher and higher, uh, as a mutual index, they'll be more and more concentrated at the edge. So it's just a question of how high in index you go. Roughly, the number of wave, you know, that the size of the wavelength around the circumference is going to correspond roughly to how far it penetrates in towards the center of the disk. And does this help to determine the mode volume that you were talking about, or are they roughly the same? Right. Yeah, yeah. So, the, you know, it's entirely extended around the circumference, which you can't really avoid because you're trying to connect two things that are a micron apart. Um, but what you can do is you can reduce the mode volume by making it decay more rapidly uh, towards the center of the disk. And so you yeah. are uh, getting more towards a one dimensional geometry. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. OK, I think we can probably uh, move towards the uh, the general uh, discussion now. So if we bring in uh, Stefania and Giordano, if you switch on your cameras. Excellent. OK, thank you. Um, so there are a couple of questions here that I guess we haven't addressed yet. What, what would be helpful um, if I could ask the audience uh, there is the capability to like the questions that appear uh, in the Slido, and uh, um, so if you if you hit like for the questions that you would like to hear answered as well, that will help me to uh, prioritise uh, questions to ask. Um, but there's one here I think which is quite a nice sort of general question which we got early on and uh, sort of held back to this point, uh, which is um, so to to everyone, do you see the future of quantum technologies focusing on single material systems, for example, germanium quantum dots, or on hybrid systems? And it was originally directed at Giordano, so let's ask him first. Uh, okay, happy to start. I think, um, yeah, there's no way out of hybrid systems. Like, uh, you need hybrid systems. Uh, we are after very complex uh, systems, and the only way to tackle it is to bring different uh, strength of different platforms. For example, yeah, germanium might, might work well for spin qubits, but then we might need a superconducting resonator to connect them uh, in a plane and to uh, modules or other kind of coupling. So I think uh, that's the way forward. Okay, thank you. Stefania, do you have a view on that question? Um, it, it, I think it depends a little bit on uh, the application, uh, uh, my point of view. Um, and uh, as we say, the quantum technology are many, uh, uh, quantum computing and quantum computing is uh, using different type of qubits. So uh, first of all, I think uh, is uh, one should define the, the application. I think for, depending on the application, then it might be the, in some cases the hybrid uh, potential quantum computer I mean, it might be the only way to go. Uh, in other application, uh, maybe there's one material could win. Uh, so I don't uh, exclude uh, a monolithic uh, quantum technology system. Uh, for instance, diamond is, well, maybe it's not that great for, uh, sorry for that, maybe I shouldn't say that great, but maybe it's not as at least thought as a quantum computer, but he has a lot of, has shown a lot of potentials, uh, as example, we saw today another way of uh, using and recenter coupling with other qubits or for, for other applications. So I think, uh, 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 depending on application, essentially, so I don't, I don't exclude completely the opportunity of one material preference. Mm -hmm. I think one thing that's absolutely clear is that you need to be able to move quantum information around between subsystems, right? 
Now, whether that involves another material or not is a, is a slightly slightly different question. You might be able to do it all with photons, but 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 you might not. My, Michael, I think I probably know uh, what your answer to this question is, but could you could you sort of comment on the sort of generalities of that? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, it, it, as you say, I'm I'm convinced that it's going to be essential to large scale quantum computing. Uh, you know, but I think it's I think that these things are complementary. It's always going to be the case that you're going to want to try to do as much as you can within one material system where you, where everything is controlled, but then you're going to have to connect it one one to the other. And as an example, even in our current computer systems, we do as much as we can with silicon, even going to the silicon gates, but uh, you still are going to need the, the interconnects, and those interconnects are not going to be silicon, they're going to be copper. Mm. And of course, when we start talking about hybrid systems, sorry, Giordano, you were going to say something? I was just that adding thing. that, yeah, just adding uh, to, to these answers, the fact that I think that hybrid systems do not exclude monolithic integration. So when I when I think about hybrid, I think of hybrid technologies, for example, spin qubit with a superconducting resonator, but they can all be done in germanium, for example, and that is monolithic integration for me. So it's with, there are different levels of hybrid, I think. And of course, yeah. you'd like to do everything with one system, with one material, but there are different levels, I think. And uh, and uh, yeah, I think the future is somewhere <laughs> along those paths, probably depending yeah. on the application. No, I think that's a really good point, because obviously from a materials perspective, there are additional challenges when you're trying to make hybrid materials, right, where, where, where you've got different materials interfaced together, that inevitably brings additional additional challenges. So um, maybe you could say a touch more, uh, Giordano, about the interface between the superconducting, uh, uh, the superconductors and the, the whole spins. That was a question that came up explicitly in, in, the, in the chat. Yeah, so this is, um... This is a growing field. Uh, in my case, we are interested in this interface, uh, not specifically to engineer, let's say, uh, topological quantum computation, but to engineer an interface between spin qubits and superconducting links, uh, which can be useful, as I said before, for um, for a long long range coupling. And um, germanium is very promising because you can as i said before holes can be contacted by superconductor by by metal directly no needs of uh, because that because the valence band uh, basically the fermi level pins at the valence band that's why it's very difficult to make electron transistors uh, with germanium but holes are very favorable therefore we can put superconductors down and uncouple those to the quantum dots and uh, we are we are working on that and that interface is crucial. You want it as clean as possible, not to introduce disorder that will then ruin your coherence time that you worked so hard to have. Yeah. In, in terms of like the, 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 the ability to make these physically ideal sort of interfaces, are there things that you sort of worry about in, in that context that there might be sort of insurmountable yeah. challenges in, in making ideal yeah. interfaces? Yeah, so what you do not want, for example, is uh, having some oxygen there, like an oxide that creates a barrier. We want it as transparent as possible. Traditionally, in the 3.5 uh, semiconductor world, the, the breakthrough was to grow directly the superconductor epitaxially in situ to have it as clean as possible interface. So yeah. we are not instead following that approach because we believe it's not really compatible with you know semiconductor industry. So we're actually trying to, again, hack what is available out in the industry as interconnects to just make them superconductor and, and drive them in the in the material. So from yeah. a top-down perspective. Okay, thank you. Uh, so there's another question here for, which is directed at Stefania about the ODMR contrast in the silicon vacancy in silicon carbide, this promising defect which you, which you highlighted, uh, compared to the contrast in other in other vacancy types. Can you say a bit about that? Oh so yes, the contrast in uh, yeah, you can achieve very high contrast in resonance. Um, otherwise, in the silicon vacancy, the contrast 
process is not very very high. Uh, it is uh, in the die vacancies uh, similar uh, to MV at the moment. Uh, so yeah, MV and diamond. Sorry. So it's still um, it's, yeah it's, it can be uh, another limitation, uh, but uh, yeah could be a way to get around that, like, for instance, in, in resonance excitation. So for the resonant excitation, should it just be limited by the, the relaxation rate, the longitudinal relaxation rate? Is that, or are there other things that can limit the, um, the, the, the ODMR um, contrast under resonant excitation as well? Uh, it, 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 it depends on the, uh, defect site because there are several there are three zero four online um also it, it's occurring at low temperature as well yes so probably your question is the answer is yes yeah um okay there's a question here for michael how does the dynamic field from the Magnon modes compare to the dynamic fields from a conventional microwave strip line? Yeah, so um, I think that uh, they are, okay, so the main challenge is that what you are looking at is the dynamic fields from a single magnon uh, versus what is essentially uh, you know a, a classical source uh, that's coming from the microwave strip line so you know you could have those edge modes with lots and lots of magnons in them that are, that are oscillating um, very intensely and you'll get a, a large amount of coupling but the the real key is you want to have uh, the transition from you know, zero magnons to one magnon be enough to couple uh, that uh, that transition of the of the spin one. So that's going to always going to be uh, relatively um, weak uh, for something that's extended over uh, over a micron. You know, here in a sense, the low magnetization of the VTC and E is favorable because. Uh, it means that there are fewer spins involved, in a sense. So, you know, if you if you went to YIG and you had a higher saturation magnetization, then to try to get it to a situation where you're making a transition from zero to one and you had, uh, you know, relatively low mode volume, it, you would really have to be in a very high uh, azimuthal index. And then there's a second question here, which may be related. What's the impact of the antenna fields on the coupling between the magnon modes and the NV centers? Uh, right. So in the image that I showed, and, and this may be where some of this is coming from, I showed sort of a more general, on, on the first slide, and I think towards the end, I showed a more general situation where uh, there was an antenna. In this particular situation, there's actually not going to be an antenna uh, present, we're not actually driving it to look for this kind of transduction. The hope is that at some point in the future, if this works, we'll be able to couple it to superconducting quantum information, and that's going to be brought in via an antenna field. And, and, and there's one here which um, is uh, relevant to uh, uh, both you, Michael, and to uh, Stefania. Um, it's uh, uh, questioning whether the magnonic coupling can be uh, done with uh, other materials like silicon carbide as well and what would be the relative benefits of uh, of that is that something that yeah. you're looking at different material systems for the qubits yeah so i mean for silicon carbide die vacancies you know the again the g is pretty close to two so the coupling is uh you know pretty uh in, in, indifferent to that and so what it cares about is the is the fringe field and that's a real magnetic fringe field so it'll affect any spin center uh, according to how the, the G is. So it should, in principle, be the same kind of thing for die vacancy in silicon carbide or you know, donor spin in, in silicon, uh, whatever. So that, that part is, is very, uh, uh, you know, can be applied to a, a bunch of different localized spin systems. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, thank you very much.
Um, well, that takes us uh, to, to the end of our uh, 15 uh, minutes chat. I'm sorry we haven't been able to get through all of the questions that have come up, but I think we've uh, we, we, we've covered most of them. So um, uh, thanks to the audience for, for submitting those questions, and thank you very much uh, again to our to our three speakers. It's been a very uh, interesting set of talks and a very interesting discussion. Thank you. So uh, just to wrap up, uh, Tessa, if you can give me uh, control of the uh, screen. Okay. So just to wrap up here, um, again, if you would like to uh, get any more uh, information um, uh, about the journal, please uh, uh, visit the website or uh, email uh, the team at uh, IOP Publishing, uh, the address and URL are there at the top of the screen. Uh, you can also follow the Institute of Physics uh, on Twitter um, at IOP uh, Materials, so you can see the latest of what's, uh, what's going on uh, the journal uh, there. And there is a, um, another webinar uh, coming up, uh, which you might be interested to, uh, to join in with. Uh, this is on integrated quantum uh, photonics and you can see the uh, list of speakers uh, uh, that we have there that's being chaired by uh, Volker uh, Sorger uh, and so uh, please do uh, sign up for that you can see the uh, the url is um, https uh, bit.ly forward slash 3fjwrxr so if you can do a quickly uh, write that down I'll keep the, the screen up there for a minute so that you can uh, you can write that down and um, you'd be very welcome to to join that webinar so I hope you've enjoyed uh, this morning's webinar I, I certainly have very much uh, thank you again to the Institute of Physics publishing team for uh, uh, setting this up and to the speakers for their uh, very nice talks and to, and to you for attending so uh, with that uh, I'll sign off and wish you all a good morning, afternoon or evening.